Lestat, the immortal vampire, turned against his will into a creature of the night, he has single-handedly fought packs of wolves, defeated satanic cults, traveled the known world, touched with his own hands the faces of the first vampires, the progenitors of his race. He has survived poison, knives across his throat and into his heart, he has been burned to his core and hurled from atop the highest tower. He has slumbered beneath the earth for decades and then decided, screw it, being a secret vampire is stupid, I'm going public and joining a band! Hello my beautiful watchers, I've been commissioned via Patreon to create a Lost in Adaptation episode comparing the 2002 film Queen of the Damned to the two books it draws from in The Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice. This has proven to be one of those occasions where there is so much source material involved and so much to unpack regarding the decisions made in the film that I fear people who haven't read the books will be so utterly lacking in context it renders my reviews impossible to follow, so I thought that before leaping into a full adaptation discussion I could perhaps regale you with the events of these books and share my thoughts them just as books. BT Dubs, this is the official first episode of my channel that's been co-written. Alisa Hansen, aka Maven of the Eventide, has once again lent her extensive knowledge of all things vampire to me. I would highly recommend checking out her channel if these bloodsuckers are your jam. The Vampire Lestat and the Queen of the Damned are books two and three of the Vampire Chronicles. Book one, Interview with the Vampire, was a lot more fortunate in its adaptation and you can see my thoughts on that via The Thing if you've not already. The Vampire Lestat was published in 1985, almost a full decade after Interview. As I said in episodes past, it seems to me that due to big changes to Rice's state of mind, it represents a slight shift in tone away from the pure despair and grief that went into the first book. Don't get me wrong, it's still dark as hell, but you can see the difference. The basic setup is, the young man who interviewed Louis turns said interview into a best-selling book. Lestat reads it and deems a lot of it unfair, misrepresentative, and highly biased, so he decides to write his own book, partly to set the record straight, partly to tell his life story, and partly because after centuries of it, he's sick of hiding and intends to publicly reveal himself to the world as a real-life vampire. What you're reading is supposedly that book, so there's no set-up framing device described in the third person like in the first novel, it's all told in the first person by Lestat. I suspect this was Rice's way of soft rebooting the franchise. By switching POV characters and deeming Louis an unreliable narrator, she's able to shift the tone of the stories and retcon certain things without full-on decanoning Interview with the Vampire. The book starts with Lestat in 1984, then cuts back in time quite a way to the 18th century for the majority of the book, telling of his life as a human, his turning, and the shockingly many vampire things he got up to in the ten years before he met Louis. There's then a surprisingly short segment about correcting some of the mistakes and lies that Louis made in his famous interview, and an explanation of what he was getting up to in between his appearances in that story. This is followed by a summary of what he did afterwards that led to his decision to bury himself, and finally a return to 1984 for the conclusion and the setup for the next book. Lestat begins his narrative with his waking up underground in 1984 to the sound of rock music. He had intentionally buried himself to starve himself of blood and enter a deep coma state so he could have a chance to heal the wounds that he'd received in the events of Interview with the Vampire and some others that occurred right afterwards. He, uh, went through a bit of a rough patch. He is enraptured with the music and reaches out his mind to connect with the young band rehearsing nearby. Liking what he feels, he digs himself out and goes to reveal himself to them, not even trying to hide that he's a vampire. To his surprise, they recognize his name, and it's here that Lestat finds out about Louis' scandalizing tell-all. Inspired by the no-shits-given liberated nature of 1980s America and rock music, Lestat decides to join the band and make himself famous, no longer hiding the fact that he is a creature of the night. He also starts his own book while simultaneously turning its contents, the big events of his life, into songs and high-budget music videos. After they're a huge success, there appears to be little doubt in his mind that they will be, and to be fair, he's not wrong. He plans to make his first public appearance by doing a massive live concert in San Francisco, and to hell with any other vampires and how they feel about him revealing their kind to the world. It's worth noting that in this opening, despite being hungry as hell, Lestat only drinks the blood of animals or waits until he crosses paths with a murderer or other nasty criminal before killing, and this doesn't come across as some big changing of his ways. Anyways, it's around now that the narrative cuts back to him as a young human, the youngest son of a French aristocratic family that has fallen on less than affluent times. His whole family kind of sucks, except for his mother. They're so wrapped up in outdated traditional ways of thinking and stupid senses of aristocratic nobility, all of Stat's hopes and dreams of what he really wants to do with his life are super crushed by them. His only solace is his boyfriend Nicholas, the son of a rich merchant in town and a talented violin player. Yeah, remember how I said that Rice was very careful about how she approached 
broached the homoerotic nature of Lestat in the first book? Well, forget all that in this one. Pre being turned into a vampire, Lestat was in a very loving relationship with a man. His mother, Gabrielle, eventually reveals to him that she agrees that their lifestyle is all baloney and that she has a fatal disease that will kill her soon. She informs Lestat that her dying wish is for him to run away to Paris and be happy with Nikki, so he does exactly that. Lestat gets a job as an actor and his career soars as soon as he's discovered due to being generally regarded as the most beautiful actor to ever grace the stage. Unfortunately, this leads to him being noticed by Magnus, a very old, reclusive, and world-weary vampire. Magnus has decided that he is super done with his unlife, but wants to leave a successor to his vampiric powers and wealth, and he chooses Lestat, kidnapping him in the middle of the night and flying him over to his tower, where he turns him into a vampire against his will. Immediately, and I do mean immediately after turning him, Magnus gives Lestat like two or three hints about staying away from the sun and where his gold is hidden, then jumps straight into a fire, burning himself to ashes. As he's getting used to being a vampire, Lestat decides that, for their protection, he can never see his former loved ones again, but uses his new wealth to help them out, sending huge amounts to Nikki and his mother, and buying the old theatre he performed at to stop his old friends from starving. Eventually, his dying mother, Gabrielle, turns up to find out why he's been ghosting her, and he decides to turn her into a vampire to save her. Because she lived so much longer as a human, and had a chance to mature as a person, she's a lot more chill about her new existence than he was. She starts wearing men's clothing, and comes up with her own views on what it means to be a vampire very quickly. So, do you remember Armand, uh, not Antonio Banderas, the book version of him? Well, it turns out that before the events of Interview, he was the leader of a local branch of a satanic cult of vampires called the Children of Darkness that live in graveyards like wraiths. They try to overpower Lestat and Gabrielle and force them into their way of life, and eventually resort to kidnapping his human ex-boyfriend Nicholas. When Lestat goes to meet them and rescue him, he manages to undo centuries of indoctrination in about five minutes by pointing out how much more fun it is to live as a gentleman in society, and proving to them that the superstitious things that the cult taught them about vampires and Christianity was complete bullshit. Armand, heartbroken that the cult that had horribly tortured him into devotion to them had been made silly and obsolete by the changing times, becomes a tad fixated on and infatuated with Lestat in a really unhealthy way. For his part, Lestat tries to immortalize his lost love Nikki by turning him into a vampire, but discovers too late that he has already been driven hopelessly mad by these events. He sets the surviving cult members up in the theatre that he owns, creating the sanctuary that Louis and Claudia would discover many years later, and leaves Nikki in their care. Armand starts trying to use all of his famous gaslighting, trickery, manipulation, and psychic abilities to get Lestat to love him and share his power with him by letting him drink his blood, but Lestat sees through it at the last second and kicks the shit out of him, though ultimately spares his life. At this point, you may have noticed that Lestat seems a tad overpowered, Leroy Jenkinsing his way through the world, defying all vampiric establishments and overpowering his elders and betters. He's not so indestructible that there's no tension to the story. You get the impression he could have died several times if he wasn't charismatic and lucky as hell, but it still left me wondering if perhaps he was as unreliable a narrator as Louis was, and what I was reading was tantamount to fan fiction Lestat had written about himself. However, if you believe in the word of God, apparently not. Rice has gone on the record saying Lestat is pretty honest in his version of events. Armand tells Lestat his rather heartbreaking life story, a key point of which that Lestat focuses on being that he was also created by an ancient vampire, Marius, who Lestat believes might still be around despite Armand being convinced that he was killed when the cult came for them. Lestat decides that his next goal should be to find this Marius. Armand begs Lestat to let him come on this quest too, but Lestat denies him, having the measure of him by now, and guessing that the young-looking vampire would eventually manipulate Gabrielle out of the picture so he could have his crush all to himself, events that would eventually play out almost exactly between Armand, Louis, and Claudia. In an attempt to give Armand's life some purpose, Lestat leaves him Magnus's tower, some of his treasure, and advises him that he should be the theatre vampire's leader before bidding him adieu. Lestat and Gabrielle travel around the Mediterranean and North Africa for about ten years, trying to find this mysterious Marius. His old friends at the theatre sent him regular letters to keep in touch, which is how he learns that his beloved Nikki eventually commits suicide in exactly the same way as Magnus, by jumping into a big-ass fire. He also gets word that the French Revolution has happened and killed off his entire aristocratic family save his father, who has fled to New Orleans in America. The sad twist just keep on coming for Paula Stat as Gabrielle decides that she's had enough of trying to blend into human society and wants to go and live free in the wilderness. When he won't go with her, she abandons him, leaving him so depressed he digs a hole in the ground to nap in indefinitely. Yes, this does seem to be his go-to solution for a lot of things. I don't not relate to the impulse. Eventually, Lestat is dug up and awakened by none other than his quarry, the 2,000-year-old vampire Marius, who takes him to his island stronghold and tells him the long tale of his turning back in the days of ancient Rome and about his important millennia-long task. It turns out
turns out he is the guardian of the very first vampires. 6,000 years ago there was a mighty king, Enkel, who, with his queen Akasha, ruled over Egypt before it was even called Egypt. Originally hailing from an even more ancient land, they had colonized Egypt and taught the filthy cannibalistic savages there to be more civilized. Eventually their powers fell victim to a haunting from an evil spirit. Wise King Enkel and his loyal wife tried to reason with the entity, but some ungrateful subjects had the poor timing and manners to surprise attack them right then and stab them both multiple times. This gave the demon a way into their bodies. It fused with the blood of one of them, turning them into the first vampire who then changed the other. They ruled as living gods amongst men for a while, making fledgling vampires to spread worship of them around and eventually inspiring the myths of Isis and Osiris. Over thousands of years they grew dormant and became living statues who move only a little every few decades or so, kept and cared for by their worshippers who would be allowed to occasionally drink their ancient blood for a huge boost in healing and strength. Most of this turns out to be bullshit in the next book, but for now it's the story. Their last keeper, a vampire known as the Elder, eventually just got so sick of looking after them and getting nothing back in return, he dragged them outside and left them to burn up in the sun. However, in a surprise twist, this resulted in every vampire in the world except them bursting into flames while they were left unharmed beyond a fashionable town, an event that became known as the Vampire Calamity. Marius had been turned just after the Calamity by a survivor barely clinging to his own life and, through a series of crazy vampire events, ended up inheriting the job of watching over them. Just as a fun experiment, Lestat sneaks into their chamber while Marius is out and plays some music for the statues on Nicky's old violin. This temporarily partially wakes Akasha, who has just enough time to exchange blood with him before her jealous husband tries to kill him for it. Marius returns in time to save Lestat, but is obliged to send him away so Enkel will calm down. He tells Lestat that if he were to call out to him telepathically, no matter where he was in the world, he would probably hear it and try to come to him if the time is right. A sad Lestat bids him farewell and travels to New Orleans to take charge of his father. This is the end of this part of the story as Lestat has reached the start of Interview with the Vampire. As was mentioned, he only takes about a chapter to tell his side of the story, as most of the events did play out as Louis described. He confirms that he was 100% in love with Louis, in part because he reminded him so much of Nicky. It's not mentioned, but his brief obsession with that young musician in New Orleans also retroactively makes more sense now. You never really get over your first love. He also takes full ownership of what an unforgivably dick move it was to turn Claudia while she was still a child, just to manipulate Louis into staying with him, especially as he saw firsthand how messed up Armand was because he was vampirized at such a young age. However, an interesting detail that he admits Louis couldn't possibly have known was he never gave up on his policy of only killing criminals, preferably murderers. Frenier, the plantation owner he fed on right after a duel, had apparently killed several times before and gambled away all of his sister's money. And the sex workers that he killed in front of Louis were apparently guilty of drugging and disposing of their rich patrons in the past. Even taking into account that Louis was apparently telling his story with very incomplete information, some of this still reeks of a serious retcon. Lestat doesn't deny the sadistic pleasure he took in toying with his victims to fuck with Louis's head, and it's hard to reconcile that with this much more sympathetic protagonist. He goes on to explain what became of him after he was set on fire and how he ended up in Paris. Too ashamed to reach out to Marius for help after being such a dickhead for so many years, he goes to Armand instead but the manipulative little bugger not only does not share his powerful blood with him, when he finds out that Lestat is in love with another vampire, he sets his sight on claiming him for himself, which is what leads to him murdering Claudia to get to Louis. When Lestat confronts Armand at the top of his old tower, the little asshole pushes him out of the frickin' window to break all of his bones on the street below. Accepting that he's going to have to heal the slow way, Lestat limps to one of his homes in New Orleans and lives as a recluse, reading literal mountains of books and feeding only on rats and other creatures of convenience. Several vampires show up to try to talk to him over the years, but he becomes so disconnected from the world he ignores them and the sacrificial human snacks they bring him. Eventually, Armand turns up after the breakup that he and Louis had at the end of interview. He immediately gets up to his old tricks, trying to emotionally manipulate Lestat into loving him, first by negging the shit out of him and then offering to share his healing blood with him only if he agrees to be with him. Even in his decrepit state, Lestat has the courage to turn him down as no restoration is worth being with an abuser. He's not sure if this actually happens or he just hallucinated it, but he distinctly remembers pushing Armand off a roof in a final satisfying comeuppance. He continues on in this weakened state until 1929, not even noticing that the century had changed for almost 30 years. When it finally dawns on him just how long he's been in this sad situation, he decides to bury himself and sleep out the rest of his healing process. The story then finally returns to the present in the 80s and the stats final preparations for his world debut. Other vampires keep leaving him threatening answer phone messages, but this utterly fails to intimidate him, partly because he can't wrap his head around what the hell sort of self-respecting vampire 
vampire leaves mean voicemails, partly because he has the strength of a cashew in his body now due to their blood exchange, and partly because he's hired an army of human bodyguards to protect him with helicopters and other cool modern shit. Then, completely out of the blue, none other than his old flame Louis saunters up to his mansion home. I'm not gonna lie, their reunion is kind of moving. I mean, you got me right. These murderous bloodsuckers are just so pleased to see each other again despite everything that had happened. It choked me up a little bit. The concert is just as massive, successful, and thrilling as Lestat expected. His music is a smash hit worldwide, and TVs everywhere play his dramatized music videos non-stop. As promised, an army of pissed off vampires try to attack him as he's leaving the venue. Unexpectedly, Gabrielle turns up to defend her son's sire, but it turns out to be unnecessary, as all of his assailants spontaneously combust before they can reach him. Later, as he's preparing to sleep out the daytime in his crypt, he wonders if Marius was his savior, so finally reaches out to him with his mind, expecting reproaches for betraying his trust, but instead getting a desperate message that, paraphrased, essentially boils down to SHIT 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 Lestat WE ARE ALL SUPER FUCKED I GAVE THEM A TV AND YOUR MUSIC WOKE HER UP SHE'S AWAKE LESTAT SHE'S FUCKING AWAKE! And just as the sun is forcing him unconscious, he realizes there's someone else in bed with him. And that is the end of the book, cliffhanger. I didn't dislike Louis as a narrator, but I have to say that the stat makes for a slightly more interesting and enjoyable one. He spends much less time regretting the horror of being a vampire, and more time gallivanting around actually doing stuff. This is partly possible because of the world building and character development that took place in interviews, so I wouldn't necessarily say this was a better book, but it is fortunately not a downgrade either. It amuses me that because of the timeline that Rice had already set up an interview between when Lestat became a vampire and when he turned Louis, she had to squeeze a lot of crazy Lestat adventures into a relatively shorter amount of time. Lestat spent 10 years fighting organized groups of other vampires, traveling all over the Mediterranean, and meeting the demigods of his race, then the next 70 years just kind of kicking it in New Orleans with his new boyfriend and daughter. I think that the biggest retcon revelation in this book was the absolute debunking of Louis's sense of moral superiority in interview. He felt that he was the more just of the two of them because he felt like an absolute shit for routinely murdering the innocent, but we now know that Lestat actively avoided the innocent as much as possible. It was interesting to see all of the actions of Armand, who seemed only mildly aware of Lestat in the first book, being reframed to revolve around him in their entirety. Also, Armand may have already been a terrible person in the first book, but this really goes all out to portray him as the absolute worst. That's not to say that he isn't a tragic figure, there's some suggestion that he could improve as a person if someone, anyone, was just willing to put the time into teaching him how, but in all the centuries he's been around he's never met a vampire willing to. Still, baggage isn't an infinite excuse to be a horrible person. Between him and Claudia being so unendingly damaged, and Gabrielle and Marius, two people who were past 40 when they were turned, handling being vampires so relatively well, it makes me wonder if perhaps Rice's vampires are just unable to develop emotionally the same way humans are. Yeesh, imagine being stuck at the level of maturity you were at when you were bitten forever. That's the kind of eternal suffering that scares the shit out of me. I don't think that I personally have the expertise to explore this, but I was left wondering if Rice was attempting to explore gender identity through Gabrielle. It's just that she rejects her femininity so utterly the second her vampire form gives her the power to do so. Philosophy, ideology, theology, and about every other deep thought are discussed in detail in this book. Every character has a different take on religion, ethics, life, good and evil, and the balance of nature and power. Lestat appears to be the embodiment of Rice's, at the time of writing, strongly held atheism and pragmatic method of thinking, and he is rewarded for this with continuous success, brought about by his being able to easily see through the needless, obsolete traditions of both humans and vampires. I've heard strange things about the direction that Rice takes later books, very strange things, but uh, for now she still seems to be on top form, and I am as equally impressed with this book as I was the first one. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Please stay tuned for my summary of The Queen of the Damned and the eventual comparison of these books to the horrible, horrible thing that was made of them in 2002. Don't forget that Creatures of the Night have nothing on the pure malevolence of the YouTube algorithm, and while crucifixes do nothing against vampires, likes, comments, and shares are an effective deterrent against it. Please take care of yourselves out there, and I will see you soon. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz and Sam Cucinotta. 
Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That that's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the dom, I can't do that, for you see, I am of the Fremen, and we use water as currency here on Arrakis. I mean, you can have some if you really want, but I'm not sure how much use you're going to get out of it. Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. Even in his decrepit state, Lestat has the courage to turn him down. Hey, Sir Terry. I'm just getting comfy on my comfy on my feet again, are you, buddy? Oh, you little floofy butthead! Come here, come here. Uh, I love you. You know, one advantage of the horrifying epidemic we're in the middle of is that there are less cars driving down the roads, blasting their huge American engines. But you still get a couple. Whoa, there was just an incredible air pressure change. Wow, what the fuck was that?